talking about AAC and transition planning for an everyday life. So Catherine, appreciate it. And I'm gonna let you take it away. Thank you very, very much, Scott. I'm uh, totally happy to be here with you guys. And thank you for being here with me on the very last day, third track, last hour of AAC in the cloud. And I would love to hear from anybody who's in the audience. Uh, if you could throw it into Slack channel three, what role you play? Are you a parent? Are you a speech pathologist? Are you an OT or a special educator or PT? Um, throw it in there and I'll try to sort of orient what I say uh, to people's interests and knowledge levels. So yay, a little bit about me. I am the AAC Services Coordinator for the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University. I'm also the parent of a young man with autism and uh, he is just turned 26 and uh, working on a degree in accounting. Um, as you can see, I'm a speech language pathologist and uh, have been working with AAC for about the last nine, 10 years. Um, discovered it and absolutely fell for it when I was working in um, the Bucks County Intermediate Unit uh, here in Pennsylvania. Um, I'm now at Temple University and uh, feel free to email me. Doesn't matter what state you live in. If you have questions, uh, please feel free to contact. Okay, so we've got a mostly SLPs here. Awesome. And here you can see just a picture of my family. And the one with the goofy grin is my oldest, Matthew, who's 26. And my son, Eric, on the left-hand side, just graduated from Temple University and is going to be teaching for city year for the next year. So there you have my proud mom moment. This quote spoke to me when I discovered it a few years ago. And it's something that I think, at least thinking back to when I was working in early intervention or in the schools, that we don't always place front and center. The idea that we are always in the process of transitioning uh, through the different stages of our lives and transitions can be times of peril. I will put it you know, even that starkly because if we're going from early intervention to school age or if we're going from middle school to high school, there's always that opportunity for information to get lost and not transition with the student. And especially if it's a student who is non-speaking and depends on AAC, that's the time when uh, there's a risk that the new team won't see all the abilities and all of the skills that that person already has with their communication that they've just used on their own or with an assistive technology um, or AAC system. So we're talking all about AT today, and of course, we're going to focus on AAC, uh, but we're going to talk about how um, we can support post-secondary transitions. We're going to talk about funding. We're going to talk about where we obtain devices and supports after graduation, because it is a lot harder at this point. And uh, we're also going to talk in some detail about the steps we can take as part of transition planning and when we should take those steps to try and ensure that we have a successful transition. So first, just a little definition. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You see some uh, uh, information from IDEA in 2004, and it defines assistive technology devices. They can be off the shelf. They can be something that you make them yourself. Uh, it doesn't have to be high tech. And uh, I wanted to emphasize on this slide that assistive technology also includes services. So it's not just about putting the equipment into somebody's hands. It's about making sure that individuals and families have those ongoing services to support their continued effective use of AT and AAC and to make sure that um, as their needs change, their technology can change to support those needs. And just a reminder, though, again, I know you guys are the choir out there that AAC includes all modes of communication other than speech. 
And for all of you who just put something into the chat window on Slack, you're using AAC. AAC is facial expressions, it's light tech devices, it's high tech, and uh, it's also sign systems and ASL, though that's not what we're dealing with here at this conference so directly, because we're talking mainly about the tools that can be used to support communication. The photo that you see here is a picture of some young men who attended our ACES program in 2018. That's uh, Augmentative Communication Empowerment and Supports. And it takes place every few years at Temple University and has since about um, 1989. Uh, so we've, right before COVID, we're getting ready to celebrate the 30th anniversary of ACES. But of course, we had to put in-person interactions um, on hold for the moment. All of the guys that you see in this photo are people who use AAC as alternative communication. So they do not speak, they have minimal ability to use any kind of a sign system. And so they rely on their technology to be their voice. And they're all three of them fortunate to have that technology, have access to core vocabulary and all of their personal fringe and all that good stuff as adults. Forms of AAC can vary, of course, from light tech to mid tech to high tech. All of these levels of AAC can require support. So when we're talking about assistive technology being not just the devices themselves, but the services, um, you know, that could be the same for a light tech system. You're gonna have to have somebody who makes sure it's updated, who makes sure it has the personal vocabulary that somebody needs to tackle post-secondary schooling or to tackle their first job. Uh, so supports are going to sort of continue across all three of these levels of the continuum. Though, of course, we're gonna focus today more on the high-tech communication devices because those are the ones for which uh, funding is gonna be the primary issue at times of transition. And we see here some examples that you're all familiar with of uh, AAC systems from light tech to high tech. And uh, I just wanna point out on this particular slide, there is a high contrast core vocabulary board in the center on the top. And it's got a black background with very colorful icons and symbols. And that even like tech can provide that access to core vocabulary and can be a robust system. So, and some adults uh, who need AAC prefer to use light tech systems. So I don't wanna leave anybody out of this conversation. Uh, light tech can also be terrifically important as a backup system for any high tech system. Any of you who were in Lauren Ender's uh, presentation a couple of hours ago, heard her talk about the importance of backing up AAC systems and a paper-based system that might be laminated and put into a binder can ensure that communication is always available even when the individual uses a high-tech AAC system much of the time. And if that high-tech system breaks, hopefully you've backed it up to a flash drive or to the cloud, but if you have a light tech system, you can have some continuity to motor planning and to access to vocabulary that looks familiar, even while that system is being repaired. So let's bust some myths about AAC. And first myth, AAC is gonna prevent speech. We know that that's not true. Another myth, not ready. This person hasn't achieved uh, object permanence or their IQ is too low. Um, also, we hear it's too late, they're too old, they can't start using AAC. All of these things are myths, including the fact that uh, the idea that there's no training needed for the use of AAC, it is like using a second language. And you all know this already. And we know what the reality is that we need to start. We need to provide access to language and social connections for any AAC user. And the reason I kept this slide in about AAC myths is that you would not believe how many times we hear myths like these in the adult world. So we'll ask, did this person have an AAC device when they were in school? 
No, they tried pecs when they were in school, but they just crumpled up the picture cards and threw them. So they weren't ready. Or no, I understand what he wants. And so therefore he doesn't need AAC. Um, the myths are still out there in the adult world but the supports aren't out there in the same way that they were in K through 12. And we have got to, I think, as a society and as a system, do a better job of making sure that information transitions with that young person, whether they leave school at 18 to go right into college or whether they stay in school until 21 and then transition into a group home or some kind of assisted independent living. Um, information often does not transition. I know I've seen it from both sides of that table now. And there are times when we are just scratching our heads because we know that something was used, but we know nothing about what the communication abilities of that person um, were when they had their robust system or even what system it was. But so we need to still bust these myths. And I think the best way we can do that is by ensuring the transition of information with that student when they go on to the adult world. And again, this is a myth that we hear all the time. Am I eligible? I see so many adults in Philadelphia who are 20, 25, 35, 40, 60, and Everybody throughout their lives has presumed that they can't, that they're too low functioning. I put those two words in air quotes because I think they're some of the most harmful words in the English language. And anybody who is not able to communicate sufficiently to meet their needs should be seen as eligible for a communication system. And then it's upon us it's really our job to figure out, okay, what is gonna work for this person in the context in which they find themselves now? But let's not let them go without, just because somebody has decided that they couldn't use PEX well enough or that their IQ wasn't high enough. We can introduce communication systems to um, emergent communicators as adults. And, um, I love the quote at the bottom of this poster from Pat Miranda. Uh, she's a researcher out of, uh, I think, British Columbia. And if you can find um, some of her research and some of her papers online, she's really worthwhile reading. So now let's talk a little bit more about what we need to do with AAC, because in school age, we tend to stick more to the needs for face-to-face -face interactions. And yes, that is very, very important. Face-to-face -face is vital and we do need to be working on that. But distance communication is vital too. And if anything, we've learned that lesson really well over the past 15, 16 months, as we've all had to transition towards using forms of augmented communication to interact uh, interact with our friends, our families, our coworkers, and our schoolmates. So let's think about this. Communication on AAC devices can include text messages, emails, posts to social media, uh, Bluetooth links to a cell phone. All of those things can be used to maintain that connection and social interaction which is the heart of using augmented of an alternative communication. We're not doing this just to get to the next progress report or to update our goals for the next IEP. We're doing it so that people can interact with each other. AAC devices now are so sophisticated. They can also help people travel from point A to point B. You can incorporate the use of like um, Apple devices with iOS 15 coming up in the fall have really, really built up their use of maps for walking routes. So imagine this, if you're a young person who relies on AAC, you're going to a job interview, you step out of the subway and you need to know how to get to the building where your interview is located. You will be able to point your Apple device at a street corner, take a picture of that street corner, and then Apple Maps will 
calculate the rest of your route walking to your destination. So that's pretty darn cool. It's also incredibly important that people be able to report on neglect, disrespect, and abuse. And this has been touched on wonderfully by many of our adult AAC users who have spoken at this conference. And I hope that you've had a chance to uh, be at their sessions or that you will catch them on um, YouTube after the fact, because they can certainly talk about this stuff better than I can. Whoops, where did my cursor go? There. So what does AAC transition too often look like as we move into the adult world? It seems a lot like falling off a cliff or diving into the unknown. And I remember when I first started a temple back in, uh, must have been the fall of 2015, and I was sent out to a town in, I think, Chester County to do an AAC evaluation. And the team for that individual told me, well, we know that this guy had AAC when he was in school. He was a ward of the state and had attended school in a different county and they had a copy of his final IEP, but the IEP did not specify the field size, the symbol set, uh, let alone the app or the device that this individual had been using. And so we knew only that this person had had access to a robust AAC system and had lost it upon transition. And all they had now was, uh, I think it was, they were in a CLA, a community living arrangement or group home, and they had a group iPad there that they were able to use to FaceTime with a close friend, but they had uh, them to rely on their gestures and their facial expressions. And I think they were ringing a bell for yes and no to talk with their best friend. So that person had a language. That language was gone when they turned 21. And we tried to track down information about what they had been doing in school and none of that, none of it, except the fact that they had used something had transitioned to the adult world. And that made me very, very sad. So here's what transition can look like if you have a best case scenario. So your speech generating device was purchased by insurance funds or through medical access funding, or your school district has agreed to prorate the value of the device and sell it to you upon graduation. Parents have been able to come into school and receive training on how to back it up, how to program it, how to use dated language, whatever is needed. And uh, the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation was involved prior to graduation. So getting that person an early start on understanding what they were going to need for their workplace. So this person has a voice, they have a backup. They have documentation of their SGD in their individualized service plan because they've transitioned right to a waiver funding program. Um, and that is the best case scenario. You know what? I don't think, at least in the Philadelphia area, that I've seen this happen more than maybe once or twice. It rarely, rarely is the case. So how do we ensure that best cases can happen and that we are doing our best to ensure that somebody continues to have access to their voice when they leave our care in the school age environment? So we have to take a look at current and projected needs. What should we be doing prior to graduation? Will the same needs continue after graduation or will those needs change? We're going to need for um, support from everybody on the team, including the sending district or the LEA. We're going to need to perhaps borrow devices and make sure that we trial things and maybe go through the insurance process prior to graduation. And even if that person is graduating in a year or two, if we think they need access to AAC and they don't have it yet, it's late, it's later than it should be, but it's not too late to start. Okay, 
So when AAC has already been obtained for a student, um, there are certain steps that we can take. We can make sure we have a comprehensive inventory of all the AAC and all of the assistive technology at large that that person uses and describe how it's being used at school, at home, and in the community, community and make sure that we're talking about um, what's going to be needed after they graduate. In most cases, sir, what the person needs are going to remain relatively the same, but uh, some of the vocabulary or some access to telecommunication may change after transition. And we've got to start thinking about who's going to provide those services after they leave school. So we've got a list everything in the IEP, you know this, uh, we've got a list, even the small stuff that can include um, if the person has a rolled up towel to provide them lumbar support in their wheelchair because their cushioning wasn't customized and it doesn't quite do the trick. And let's start the conversation about ownership with that AAC user involved at the age of 14. In Pennsylvania, that's when we typically start looking at transition goals. Let's include the AAC user in that conversation. Let's give them that respect and start that discussion so that maybe we don't have to deal with a last minute insurance request, or maybe we understand how ownership of a device is going to transfer. And if you do need to do that Medicaid request or request through private insurance, private insurance please start before senior year if you can. It's not always possible, but uh, I've been in a position once or twice where I've had somebody who was graduating in a month and all of a sudden they have a new device and maybe they even have to go from communicator four to communicator five and transition their software and not everything goes smoothly. So we wanna make sure we're starting as early as possible. And here's a really, good pointer if you're working with parents whose child is in you know the second half of high school if they're going to have to prove their disability in another setting such as higher education request a formal reevaluation for senior year this happened in our case we knew that my son was going on to college and junior year his team contacted me and said you know what we think we know what we're doing and things are going well for your son. So we don't think we need to do a triennial reevaluation. And we want you to waive that evaluation. That was junior year. So I said, okay, I'll waive it now, but be well aware of that senior year in about October, I'm going to request a formal reevaluation because that way the paperwork is less than a year old. That way it can be used to request the accommodations that you need in your post-secondary environment. So AAC in the IEP, let's describe it everywhere, including embedding it into how we're working on those transition goals, whether it be a goal for work or a goal for housing, how is AAC going to support that after transition? And please, let's make sure we're building in that time, whether it be with the SLP or the assistive technology consultant for those supports for parents and caregivers uh, so that they don't feel quite as, as if they're falling off a cliff when their child transitions. And I love this quote from Chris Klein from 2017. I won't read it to you right now, but I love the fact that he centers AAC use as being about being an effective relation, uh, relationship builder, an effective communicator, because this is really what we should be about. Can somebody build relationships with other people? Can they socialize to meet their needs for companionship or romance or marriage even? And if you take a look at the NJC's uh, Communication Bill of Rights, the very first right listed on that document talks about the right for social connection. And here is an issue which often doesn't get addressed or addressed fully while somebody is still in school all the kinds of vocabulary that may not be represented on that device, that's gonna allow them to engage in work 
uh, transportation, um, directing their own care. Some of this is about the vocabulary. Some of it's about having pre-stored phrases on their device so that they can interact with a bus driver for CCT or with the office manager where they work. Some of it is about adding fringe vocabulary that's going to allow them to have conversations for adult leisure activities. And yes, relationships, including romance and marriage and sex. All of those things are important. And this is an issue that um, my supervisor and I was really, really, um, she was really looking at this a few years ago. We were talking about building vocabulary sets. And it's not so much that we're teaching about sex in school age, but do we have access to all the body parts? Is that kind of vocabulary just sort of normal from a young age? I mean, very little children talk about their body parts. Three and four year olds love potty talk even. Um, all of those developmental stages are really important and access to all the vocabulary is super important if someone is gonna be able to report abuse or to uh, have a relationships where they feel comfortable with what's going on in that relationship. Um, the YouTube link that I included in here, you can look at uh, on your own. It's to a wonderful video on YouTube of an AAC user. He's very young and he's talking with his uh, triplet sister. They're at the dinner table. Some of you might have seen this already, but they're talking and mom is in the background and she might be busy cooking, but they start doing potty talk and they start talking. That. And so the little guy with his AAC system, he was using Unity and he goes in and he says, poop, poop poop. Did mom take away his device? Did she shut it off? Did she shut off his volume? No. She just treated him like one of the family and said, hey guys, are we talking about poop at the dinner table? Come on, let's talk about that somewhere else. She just treated it as language from a young communicator. And I think there's a lot of that that gets lost in school age because we're worried about a whole bunch of things. I don't need to go into you understand it, but if people don't have the words, how are they going to be able to talk about things later? Um, and uh, on yesterday's uh, schedule for AAC in the cloud, I attended a session by Donnie Denome. Uh, they and Cole Sorensen presented wonderfully about some of these issues, and this quote really stuck with me. Uh, the best victim is one who can't tell. Make sure they can tell. People need practice. People need all the words to be able to talk about what touch makes them feel okay, what touch makes them feel uncomfortable what touch is needed if they have a complex body for hygiene or for making sure they stay healthy and what touch is not welcome and how to say no. Joe Shapiro is a reporter for National Public Radio and back in 2018, he did a wonderful investigative piece on the hidden epidemic of sexual assault. And that was among people who have intellectual disabilities he wasn't even focused on our folks who can't talk at all. And the rates are stunning. Uh, the rates of abuse, sexual abuse and other types of abuse are way higher for people with disabilities. Uh, so this is most definitely an incredibly important issue. And even just the idea of teaching that saying no is okay, that you can say no and your wishes are gonna be respected. Um, and that you have bodily autonomy, those are really important skills that our folks should graduate from school knowing how to do. So some of what we know about transitions, we know that competent AAC use doesn't necessarily carry over. We know that specific skills need to be practiced. And we know that uh, there needs to be that careful planning to make sure that people have successful transitions. So let's talk more about those environments that folks might find themselves in after they graduate. 
here's another photo from uh, ACES back in 2016. And um, people do go to college. People with even very complex disabilities go to college, get degrees. The young man in this picture um, has an associate's degree in social work. And you may have seen him elsewhere. He's, uh, he's pretty prominent and does a lot of uh, advocacy work and it is on the board for Disability Rights Pennsylvania at this point. So people will find themselves in educational settings, in competitive employment. They may find themselves living in a dorm and uh, everyone, no matter what setting they're in, should be involved in community participation. Um, and here are some examples I wanted to share of universities that specifically have programs that can meet the needs of students with uh, disabilities. Wright State University in Ohio, um, I just really found out more about them last fall. They were built in the 1970s on what had been farmland. And the founders of the university decided, hey, let's make it accessible from the very beginning. This was way before ADA. It was way before a lot of uh, accessible education law, and yet they did it from the start. And they got a series of federal grants that allowed them to establish a personal care center on campus. Uh, they would do a program so that students can act as personal aides to those with disabilities. And students with uh, disabilities um, take a class the very first semester about directing their own care. And um, there are some wonderful books by people who have gone to Wright State University. Uh, definitely take a look at Wright State if you know somebody who might be considering college. And by fortune or luck or planning, they employ somebody who is an ATP and is the parent of an AAC user. And so they've kind of got that built in ability to support people when their devices break or when their access modality isn't working. Uh, so really, really interesting place. Temple University has a slightly different program. It's called Leadership and Career Studies, and it's part, it, partly run by the Institute on Disabilities. And it's a program for students with intellectual disabilities who want to go to college. And uh, up till now, they've had a few students who might have been part time AAC users, but because the IOD houses Tech Owl, um, they have the built in ability to support AAC users should somebody want to attend. And um, there are some requirements for independent transportation and being able to navigate in the city on your own. But yes, students attend higher education, even with intellectual disabilities. Temple is not the only program and they can graduate either with a leadership and career studies diploma, or if they want to uh, also with a certificate in uh, disability advocacy and studies. Now, what does the ADA mandate in higher education? What's the law say? Federal law does not require post-secondary institutions to provide highly customized and personalized AT or AAC. Um, they will provide auxiliary aids that are needed to access the curriculum. Um, they mandate that universities have to make learning accessible to students with disabilities and um, that universities can't exclude somebody based on the idea that their disability is going to make them more expensive to serve. In the workplace, other things that we have to consider, does the current AAC system suffice? Is it enough to uh, be able to link in with email or link in with the office phone system? Are you going to need new skills, new technology and new supports when you enter the workforce? Um, is the student going to be able to advocate for those needs once they start their first job? And for all of these things, if we're going to really plan well and include all of this planning into um, the IEP or into transition goals before people graduate, we have to, of course, deal with that funding aspect. 
And we need to be able to defend why we're requesting a device through insurance for that person. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the different funding sources. I'm most familiar with Pennsylvania. Um, I see that somebody put into the Slack channel that they're a graduate of Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania. Uh, up until a few years ago, they were included with Wright State and a few others at the list, a top of a uh, list of top disability friendly schools. Um, and it sounds like the experience fee might not have been perfect, but they lived on a dorm with students in wheelchairs and they had PCAs and van transport and campus OT. So it's really good that these resources exist and we've got to always advocate to make them better. So funding sources. The school district can purchase a device through special medical access funding. Sometimes vocational rehab programs will also pay for an AAC device. We've got Medicaid, private insurance, employers as potential funders. And then there are also alternative funding sources. So I've known people who have crowdsourced their technology. Is that ideal? No. But in one case, five years ago, I had a friend whose son was diagnosed with a cancer with a rhabdomyosarcoma that kind of, if you want to picture where the tumor was, if you slapped your own face and had your thumb on your brain stem, that's where the tumor was. And we didn't know that he would be able to continue to speak as he went through uh, his treatments. He's okay now, uh, but we were able to use crowdsourced uh, funding, GoFundMe, to get something for him to make sure he still had access to communication. Uh, in your different states that you all come from or countries, you may have local grant programs, you may also have loan programs or previously owned equipment programs. So wherever you are, if you're in the US or a US territory, uh, take a look at the passitoncenter.org. That is out of the um, AT Act program at the University of Georgia in Georgia. And they have links to take you to the used equipment uh, programs in each state. And uh, they're very involved when there are natural disasters and people lose their equipment, such as hurricanes or earthquakes as well. And it's a bit like a Craigslist. So you never know in advance uh, what's going to be available, but you might as well check and see. Alternative funding in Pennsylvania includes the P Pennsylvania Assistive Technology Foundation. Uh, they offer no to low interest loans under certain conditions. Uh, they also offer financial education and a lot of information and assistance, and they can cover anything from a small need up to helping a family finance uh, a ramp van or home modifications to make sure that the person can live uh, and have their needs met at home. So there may be programs like this in other states, and if you know of some in the states that you're in or the countries that you're in, put them in the Slack channel. Um, school funded, we've already talked about this already. Um, one of those reasons that I really want the transition discussion about equipment to start at the age of 14, because if the LEA is going to be resistant and say, oh, maybe um, we're just going to take that device back after graduation, if you start wearing them down, if you start being the squeaky wheel at 14, maybe that conversation changes over time and you can work creatively together to come up with some good answers. Uh, School-based access, I haven't actually used this with any of my students in the past, but if your school is enrolled in medical access and the student is a Medicaid beneficiary, there is this pool of funding that can be used through medical assistance to provide equipment and the ownership of that equipment, to my understanding, goes with the family or the student. So that is another resource to at least look into if you're working in the schools. See, has your district ever used that before? Are they willing to explore it, if eligible? Um, Medicaid. We use Medicaid a ton in our work at Tech Owl uh, to look at uh, AAC devices for adults with disabilities. And it can be challenging because um, we still have to always prove medical necessity. 
I happen to think that it should be enough that somebody can't talk well or is unintelligible and can't be understood, but CMS doesn't agree. So uh, we still have to look at everybody's comprehensive medical history and see if we can find a way to prove that medical necessity as we do our insurance request. Um, Medicaid funding is also dispersed in, uh, through home and community-based services in Pennsylvania. We have waiver programs and people are eligible for these programs at the age of 21. Um, so they may be able to apply. And if you apply early enough, who knows, maybe you can make that transition be a lot more seamless. Um, but I know a lot of young adults who are waiting they're waitlisted, they're base funded, they have no real services until they have waited two years to get onto the consolidated waiver or waited a year and a half for the autism waiver. So be aware of waiver funding, how it works in your state, how are Medicaid funds dispersed and how soon can you get on that waiting list and try to enroll the individual or have the individual enroll themselves in those programs, at least get on the waiting list. Uh, private insurance, keep in mind that this does have that cutoff at the end of 20, uh, age of 26. My son just lost his coverage on Tuesday and is applying to the ACA. And when that Supreme Court decision came out the other day, boy, it was hosannas in my head because I was like, yeah, it's still there. He can apply to that. Because as a young man with autism, finding a job has been difficult. Finding he has found jobs, but have they provided medical benefits? Uh, so take a look even at the ACA if you have to, and um, as a potential resource for continued coverage, I, it's gonna depend upon the individual plan as to how they cover, I'm sure, medical equipment and how that process works. Vocational rehabilitation is also another resource to look at, so they can cover assistive technology, Again, we're in the world of eligibility and not entitlement at this point. So there may be a waiting list. There may be a cost share depending upon your family income. Um, but I have known at least one person to get a dedicated communication device covered through Vogue Rehab because they wanted to work and they needed a robust system to be able to work. Employers have certain obligations under the ADA, and these obligations are really for reasonable accommodations. So typically it might be providing an interpreter or software for screen readers, modifying job duties to meet the needs of the individual, or providing a flexible work schedule. You know, it's worth looking at whether an employer will be willing to purchase an app or purchase equipment that can be used for communication. Um, you might as well explore that avenue, but their obligations are somewhat limited uh, because of that language about being a reasonable accommodation. Um, and, you know, this is a whole big discussion. We could talk about this for an hour because employment and people with disabilities post COVID we see a lot of accommodations that happened during the pandemic being taken away. Employers requiring that people come in and do face-to-face, -face, um, things that may make it more difficult post-pandemic for people with disabilities who actually benefited somewhat from some of the remote work accommodations that were made during the uh, pandemic. Post-secondary, Institutions, we talked about how they're not required to provide highly personalized equipment. Um, but if somebody's going to be in a computer lab, then that place, that college must provide the AT to allow them to access the hardware or the software that they need. And make sure that you're making this request and talking to disability services before you attend. The year before, when you're visiting, when you're touring, stop by disability services, talk with them and see what kinds of uh, accommodations they can provide for your individual. And advocate, advocate, advocate. Uh, 
tips on transitioning to higher education include a lot of stuff that we've talked about already. Making sure that you have that reevaluation while still in high school, uh, talking with OVR, because OVR, vocational rehabilitation, can in some cases help to pay for post-secondary education. Visit your schools and really take a look at what, are, what is their knowledge of assistive technology? Do you see students with disabilities on campus? Um, are they going to answer your questions about assistive tech when you're on a tour? Will they show you where disability services is located and let you stop by? And as we start to get towards the end here, let's also talk about just ensuring that we're doing everything we can to increase somebody's independence prior to graduation. And again, centering the idea that communication is much more than just face-to-face. So we know that for people with complex bodies, that smart home technology can play a vital role and that AAC voices can activate smart home tech such as Google Home or Alexa, and that you can hook your system up with smart plugs and smart appliances and doorbells and thermostats and really help ensure that somebody has the best shot at being independent in their and just the little things that we all do from you know the moment we get up to the moment we go to bed. And uh, can we plan this stuff prior to transition? Is there a way to get a smart device onto a Wi-Fi network and have somebody practice giving commands, making sure as you program an Alexa page into somebody's device that you've got all the little fidgets that you need to make sure it works, like a pause after you input the name Alexa into a button. Uh, so I know that Wi-Fi and HIPAA and FERPA and all of these things can make this really complicated, but is there a way that we can work on this before somebody leaves our care? And can we look at a way to ensure that somebody with a dedicated device like an Accent or an iSeries device or a Nova Chat can engage in telecommunication? They will need to get a very specific type of, usually it's an Android phone, but each state has a telephone device distribution program. And you can check out this uh, website, tedpot.org, to see what's available in your state. And uh, the program in Pennsylvania is run out of Tech PA, and um, you can get a phone like an iPhone or an iPad with a phone plan or other types of telecommunication equipment, plus landline phones, some people still use those. And if you meet the um, requirements for income and you're six years or older, you can get that equipment for free. So check out tedpod.org. How well does that kind of stuff work if you're gonna Bluetooth in a dedicated device to a smartphone? Uh, my friend Ami um, uses an Accent 1400 and he loves to joke. He's like, okay, I'll tell you if you pay me $75. But uh, he said sometimes the Bluetooth pairing will drop and has to be repaired, but it works pretty well. And Ami is currently working for a company remotely and is very happy being back, back at work. Um, and uh, when we talk, most of the time we're talking remotely to each other. We're using that distance communication to send each other emails, to text message, or to chat over a Zoom call. And ANCs and Zoom can actually work pretty well. For the past 16 months or so, we've been doing AAC meetups through Tech Owl PA. And uh, these are twice a week on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons, typically at 2 p.m. And anybody who's involved in AAC can register and show up. And we just have a conversation. We talk about anything and everybody, everything. Uh, not everybody. Uh, we're all adults. We talk about relationships. We talk about jobs. And it's really worked quite well over AAC as long as people have newer devices. And one of our problems in the beginning was that everybody, all the guys had Ryan as their voice, right? And so we really had to make sure that people were kind of raising their hand electronically or letting us know that they wanted to talk. 
So let's continue Zoom access to, especially to conferences. AAC in the cloud has had this down pat for the last five years, but other conferences I hope will continue to allow people to attend remotely so that we're not denying access for people who live too far away or for whom traveling might pose an imposition. And don't forget that AAC apps and devices can export messages through email and to social media or to Google Hangouts or to a printer. There's a lot of stuff you can do. I know you know this, but are you practicing it? When somebody's 14, 15, 16, how cool would it be to be able to text their best friend or to send an email to their mom or maybe not their mom, but to somebody else that they want to interact with? And are we making sure people have the skills to do this? And um, let's just ensure that nobody graduates from our care at the age of 21 without their voice. Um, and if you haven't watched the, pro, uh, the uh, presentation by Cole Sorensen and Donnie Denome, definitely take a look for it on YouTube after the fact. It's absolutely awesome. And they spoke a lot about different types of adverse childhood events and what constitutes trauma if you're a person with a disability. And I thought this quote was also very powerful. Denial of communication access is fundamentally traumatic. Are we letting people graduate from our care and into trauma because they don't have a voice? Now we have some AAC community website um, resources that I just thought I'd throw in here in case you're not familiar, aaccommunity.net is a website that we run at TechOwl. And, um, it has like tech core boards that you can print, medical communication boards, uh, AAC app support on YouTube, plus the two that we see here at the bottom, consider communication and AAC for SLPs. These are modules that support training, consider communication targets, people who might not know a lot about AAC. So it might be good resource for uh, direct service providers, or relatives or nursing staff. AAC for SLPs might better meet the needs of um, your post-secondary SLP. You find an SLP in the adult world, they might not know anything about AAC. I can't say the number of times that I've seen somebody who might be 25, 30, 32 years old, they have cerebral palsy with primary spasticity, their voice is very, very limited. And an SLP is still working on pronouncing B and M and D, and they don't know enough about AAC. We wanted to put a resource out there that was gonna help SLPs and other therapists and professionals who don't know a lot about augmentative communication and support pre-service trainees. So if you're teaching a grad course on AAC, there might be some resources here as well that you can show to your students. And let us know if there's anything that we can add to these modules. We're happy to add more information. And uh, I think what I forgot to mention towards the beginning of this, when I said that I worked at TechOwl, it's not just part of the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University. It is also the State AT Act program for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So we have a free learning library. We do free video demonstrations. We run reused equipment programs and the free special phones. And a lot of that stuff can be found on the other website that we have, techalpa.org. So take a look at that and take a look at the resources that you might be able to avail yourselves of. And thank you so much. You guys were here on the last presentation in the third channel, the last hour of the conference. Thank you so much for your patience. We have four minutes. If anybody has any questions, of course, I'm happy to answer them. And I would uh, deeply appreciate if uh, some people are willing to take this QR code or the bit.ly and provide us some feedback. Uh, it'll take you to a form. Uh, we use that feedback to help talk to our funders at the state and the federal level to make sure that we receive the funding that can support our continued services 
to the people of Pennsylvania with disabilities. So I very much appreciate that. All right, feel free to throw anything into the chat that you want to. Thank you, Joni. And uh, thank you very much for attending today. And thank you, uh, Cough Drop, for making this conference possible even before we had a pandemic and all needed to be online. Absolutely. So we'll see if there's any questions. I think it, uh, you may get emailed some questions after everybody has some time. That's to perfect. Decompress. Just shoot me an email. Oh, the end of the conference here, but uh, that was great. Um, feel free to also check out the Slack channel as well if there's some questions you can answer afterwards as well. So mm -hmm. we appreciate uh, everyone joining this conference again this year. We we enjoy doing this, but it's definitely uh, we're, we're happy when it's over. <laughs> it's a labor of love. Yeah. <laughs> Hope you guys all get to sleep all day tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks again, Catherine. That was awesome. Uh, lots of things uh, I have to think about with my son's coming up as well. So, um, but we always appreciate it. And everybody have a good evening or whatever time of day it is.